We have the wonderful Speaker of the House, Speaker Mike Johnson. You know, you were a uh, litigator, a constitutional litigator. I've done that for 40 years now. I really get tired of lawyers, I don't care what their backgrounds are, saying, well, the system's killed, it's dying, we'll do the appeal process through New York. Now, I don't know how you did what you did before you became Speaker, but I would sit down with my guys at Landmark Legal, I said, all right, how do we, how do we win? And we would come up with ideas, not crazy, smart. Some of them a little rare. And more times than not, we would win. Now, if, if it's true what happened is such an abomination, that they're interfering with a federal election at a, one judge and one prosecutor, why wouldn't you develop a plan to get a path to the Supreme Court to allow the Supreme Court to decide if they want to get involved or not? Why would you take that off the table? Yeah, I don't understand that, Mark. I agree with you 100 percent, and I, I made the comment in interviews this morning about that. I, I think you've got to run every possible play. Why Why not uh, go try to go directly to the Supreme Court? I, I think the, the the urgency of the hour and the unprecedented nature of this, the, the dramatic importance of it to the whole country, uh, dictates that, that that should be done. At least you've got to try, I think. I mean, I yeah. agree with that that analysis. I mean, I'm talking about a common law writ, no writ of certiorari. We're not talking about a statute, but a common law writ, rarely used but has been used, yep. uh, where basically, as you know, the judiciary decides on its own, based on its own precedent and so forth, whether to take up a case. And I look at Bush versus Gore. They took it up. They took it away from the Florida Supreme Court, and they took it up because they said, this is a presidential race. We only have one of these, and the state is changing the voting system in violation of equal protection law, so we need to step in. And I'm thinking, okay, so it's not like they 100% won't. So if everything's on the line, Mr. Speaker, and it is, why am I having so much difficulty convincing not everybody, but so many other people? Maybe it's because they they, they just have uh, blinders on, given their own background as prosecutors or defense lawyers. They don't think like constitutionalists. You used to, and I do, right, when you were litigating. Yeah, well, look, I've gotten the same resistance and a little pushback today that you have, and uh, and I've been a little confounded by that as well. I mean, I thought of the Bush v. Gore precedent also immediately. I mean, it, that's that's the that's the analogy that fits here because again of the the sensitivity of this and and the importance of it. I mean, I you know I, I think that there, my sense is that a majority of the of the court would recognize that as well and and understand that we're playing with fire here, and that this needs to be corrected quickly. It can't linger. Uh, long like this, because it's undermining the people's faith in our system of justice itself. And to me, that is the greatest threat that transcends even the, 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 this presidential cycle. It's, it's like people are losing their faith in our institution, and that's the danger, I think. You can't have a Soros prosecutor and an acting Democrat Biden supporting judge uh, seize federal authority in a federal presidential election that impacts every corner of the country. You have thousands of state and local prosecutors. At some point, the Supreme Court's going to have to step in. And my view is it needs to step in and nip this in the bud, and we need to get them there. I mean, they can't do it on your own. You've got to petition them. So you've got to figure out what's a good, rational petition. Maybe we have a 10% chance, but isn't it worth it? The answer is yes, is it not? I think it is. I think you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, and, and you, you can't leave anything on the table here. I just think that I, I just think it's too important. And uh, so much is riding on this, of course. And, you know, the, the, the weaponization of, the, of our system is doing lasting damage here. You know, the Democrats were cheering this, of course, and mm-hmm. they're going to do nothing to, to silence dissent, crush their political opponents. They, they've, they've taken this dramatic step. They've risked the destruction of our entire system of justice to stop our nominee for president because he was crushing Biden in the polls. I mean, that's what is motivated this. And everybody who looks at it objectively has to come to the same conclusion. I mean, even the people that are cheering this along, they know, they know in their hearts that this is wrong and it's dangerous. It really is. So Biden speaks today in the second part of what he said. The first part was atrocious. He talked about Israel's plan. It's not Israel's plan. He, he uh, Hamas immediately accepted his proposal because behind the scenes, he, Qatar, which is a terrorist state, Egypt, uh, have been working with Hamas on this deal. And basically it lists Hamas's, what Hamas wants, Israel, Shabbat, 
they're all, you know, pretty much closed down, focused on family there. And he announces it during Shabbat. But I, I want to get into one other thing. He says about this case that that uh, what what Trump is doing is dangerous and undermines this. Let me ask you a question. Did he say when Chuck Schumer talked about really revenge against two Supreme Court justices or the attack that's taking place on Alito? Or when he said, basically, the Supreme Court justices don't have any brains. It's not the, it's, it's not the, he's defying Supreme Court uh, decisions and so forth. Who is it that's really undermining justice? Donald Trump defending himself and speaking the truth or Joe Biden? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's Biden and everybody who is doing his bidding. And, and it's such an extraordinary double standard. They don't even seem to recognize how absurd it is. I mean, the left has been apoplectic. Um, about Justice Alito, speaking of that, you know, they, they just insist that he's got to recuse himself from future cases at the court because his wife waved a flag at their home. And yet the judge in Manhattan was an open Biden donor. I mean, uh, clearly a supporter of the opponent of the defendant that's in his court. His, his daughter is making, raising, you know, millions of dollars on the trial that's going on before him. I mean, the whole thing just smacks of corruption. And, and again, everybody can see it. And, and they're blaming, of course, that this is out of the playbook. They, they blame the other side for exactly what they're doing. But, I mean, they've, they've done it. It's so absurd, Mark, that I, I just think <laughs> most independents, and I think a lot of Democrats, I think they, they understand what's happening here. They're willing to go along with it because they think the stakes are so high. And, and that, to me, is just unconscionable. About 20 Republican senators, give or take, have signed a letter and said, you know what, Joe Biden, don't send us any more nominees. We're going to block every damn one of them. They Mm -hmm. also said, don't send us any so-called bipartisan legislation. We're not interested. You're going to get the same sense probably in the House, I would think, right, by a number of Republicans? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, desperate times call for desperate measures. We have been the bulwark and the stopgap of the radical progressive agenda in the House because, of course, we only have the majority in, in our one chamber, and it's the smallest majority in history, as everyone famously knows now. Um, but uh, we're going to do everything we can to hold them accountable for this and to conduct oversight. You know, today, uh, Jim Jordan, uh, I'm, I was in Ohio with Jim yesterday, and he issued uh, a notices. We're, we're going to drag, uh, at least attempt to drag, Alvin Bragg in before the Weaponization Select Committee in the House to answer for this and the rogue prosecutors we're going to have them come in and try to explain to us how this is fair uh we'll see if they defy that um that uh, order to come and testify to us but we're going to do our job and 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 hold the line in every possible way we can and and get accountability for this because we have to do it and the thing is i'd i'd, I'd sure like to know about all the communication from his office to the Department of Justice or other judges or to the White House and so forth, because, you know, the White House likes to laugh it off and the media keeps saying, what's your proof that Biden's behind it? You know, uh-huh. Mr. Speaker, we, we, were, we didn't just fall off the tuna boat here. You don't have to have a written contract when Joe Biden goes out there and, and basically compares Trump to Hitler. That means do whatever the hell you have to do to defeat this man. Or when he's talking about the attorney general of the United States, like a ponderous judge, he sent out enough signals out there to basically trigger action by the whole Democrat Party machine, has he not? Right. That's exactly what they've done. They've they've spurred this on. They sent the signal that that, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And if we have to weaponize the entire uh, legal system and the Department of Justice itself, so be it. I mean, that's where we are. And again, the, the peril of that is that you undermine one of the foundational components that allow us to keep this republic. And that's what's at stake. I mean, this is a, a battle for the survival of the country. I mean, it's, it sounds like hyperbolic language, but it's not an overstatement. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you this, though, Mark, that we, and the good news is, I mean, I've, I've now, today I was in my 115th city in 29 states oh, in the last man. six months. The Speaker of the House has to go everywhere, you know, campaigning with our candidates and incumbents. And I'm telling you that over the last 24 hours, I've watched this on the ground. I'm in the Midwest. It was in Ohio and and Michigan uh, the last uh, over the last 24 hours. Um, this verdict is going to drive voter turnout in every corner of the country and in mm-hmm. some of these swing states that we desperately need. This is going to backfire fantastically on the Democrats. That's my uh, my uh, prediction. Just based upon people, just kind of men on the street and at these grassroots events that I'm talking to, I I think this is going to. It's going to work in our favor, and and Mm -hmm. it's going to ensure that Donald J. Trump gets reelected president. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you very much. Keep up the good work. 
And uh, we got to increase our numbers in the House. We got to take the Senate. And by God, we got to win the presidency if we're going to save this country. And I'll tell you what, I do view this as what they call an existential threat to us as well as our allies. I don't know how Israel can survive another four years of Joe Biden, to be perfectly honest with you. I don't know how we do. I mean, the country will survive. It just won't be the same country. So keep up the campaigning. Keep up the fundraising. Keep up the fighting. Every inch is worth fighting for, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Absolutely. And remember this. The American people are going to render the ultimate verdict, and that's on November 5. We can't get there soon enough. God bless you. Take care of yourself, and best to you and your family. Thank you, my friend. Same to you. All right. Speaker Mike Johnson, very, very decent human being, too, by the way.